that it is time that world governments officially acknowledge November 1973, Pioneer 10 took off on a journey to the stars. It carries with it a message from the people of Earth. On board is a plaque that tells who we are and where we live, our calling card to the stars. Pioneer will eventually leave our solar system. No one knows if its message will ever be received. There may be many civilizations among the stars, and making contact with them is one of man's most exciting adventures. But has that contact already been made? Is it possible that astronauts from other worlds have already visited us? and left behind their calling cards here on Earth. One startling hypothesis about man's past begins with an alien spacecraft approaching Earth. Man was still primitive and uncivilized. In terror and wonder, he watched the descent of the fiery gods from heaven. The spacecraft landed, and the astronauts visited Earth. They performed great deeds, then departed. And to this day, the tale of their coming is related in ancient legends told throughout the world. Nine years ago, this remarkable thesis created a sensational worldwide bestseller. It drew a completely new picture of man's prehistory. The book was Chariots of the Gods, written by the Swiss author Eric von Daniken. I tried to prove that this planet has been visited by beings from outer space several times in antiquity. Second, I say that one of these first visits was the reason why Homo sapiens has become intelligent. So uh, they made with our forefathers a kind of uh, artificial mutation. And finally, these visits from outer space have gone into old religions, into mythology, and uh, even, at some cases, into archaeological artifacts. Does this Mayan carving from Mexico show a space traveler crouched in his rocket? Could these strange lines on the Peruvian desert be the landing strips of space vehicles? How can one explain these carvings which show beings gazing through modern telescopes at the stars? And the massive structures of the ancient world. Did astronauts help build the pyramids? And the statues of Easter Island? Who gave this African tribe detailed knowledge of invisible stars discovered only last century? Astronauts from other worlds? These are the questions von Daniken answers in startling fashion. And if he's right, we can tear up the history books. Das, das gibt nur wieder Mist. Gibt nur Mist. Gibt nichts ernst. He has sold over 40 million copies of his books worldwide, and his popularity shows no sign of diminishing. His appeal may lie partly in his continual, almost contemptuous challenging of orthodox views. And although his theories may be scorned by traditional scientists, they have certainly struck home with the public.
Most of the year, he spends traveling. Everywhere, he seeks new evidence for the visits of ancient astronauts. People are intrigued by his findings. Many suspect that perhaps the conventional view of our past is wrong, because von Daniken produces evidence to prove it. The gezielte künstliche Mutation erfolgte nach ihrem Ebenbild. Why are his ideas so popular? One person who studied the von Daniken phenomenon, himself an expert on extraterrestrial intelligence, is Carl Sagan. We are thinking beings. We are interested and excited in understanding how the world is put together. We uh, seek out the extraordinary. And uh, if you think of these claims, if only they were true, they would be amazingly interesting. But we have been visited by beings from elsewhere who not only have created our civilization for us, but mated with human beings. It's, in my view, much more likely to successfully mate with a petunia than an extraterrestrial. Um, but certainly there is a, a degree of fascination um, if, uh, if such accounts were true. Danikin himself is unmoved by such skepticism. I accept and admit that this theory uh, will not convince uh, conservative scientists, but this has always been like this. There is not one simple theory which uh, today is the truth, which has convinced in those days the scientists. Take, for example, the, when the first cave paintings were discovered in Spain, in the Altamira caves or other places, the whole archaeological world were against it. They all said, it must be a fake, it's wrong. Well, it's not. It takes usually a generation or at least 10 or 20 years until a new theory uh, will be accepted. Von Däniken's theory is remarkable, yet by no means impossible. So how good is his evidence? The most impressive monuments of the ancient world are the pyramids at Giza. They've long been a source of mystery. Von Däniken suggests the Great Pyramid at Giza contains hidden formulas for finding the height of the sun and the secrets of immortality. He writes, The Great Pyramid is and remains visible testimony of a technique that has never been understood. Today, in the 20th century, no architect could build a copy of the Pyramid of Cheops, even if the technical resources of every continent were at his disposal. We know next to nothing of the how, why, and when of the building of the pyramid. An artificial mountain 490 feet high, weighing 31 million tons, stands there as evidence of a remarkable achievement. Two million, six hundred thousand gigantic blocks were cut out of the quarries, dressed and transported and fitted together to the nearest thousandth of an inch. The pyramid, like so many other wonderful things, shot out of the ground, so to speak. Of course, it helps the astronaut theory if things appear suddenly. In fact, the Great Pyramid is the culmination of a long tradition. Two hundred years before it, on the edge of the desert west of the Nile, the first tombs of the pharaohs were being built. They were underground chambers called mastabas, built of sun-dried mud bricks. From these simple tombs developed the true pyramids. The first was at Saqqara, the stepped pyramid of King Djoser. Djoser's pyramid began as an ordinary mastaba, with tomb chambers and passages underneath. A small stepped pyramid was later built on top, and then a second larger pyramid was added, leaving the structure that we see today. This was to be the model for all later pyramids. The 
The design of Djoser's pyramid owes its strength to the buttress walls that lean inwards to the center. But the next pyramid built was not so successful. At Medum, a second large pyramid rose from the desert. What we see today is a ruin. Only the central core still stands. The Meidum structure was once covered by a stepped pyramid, and this in turn was filled in to give the true pyramid shape. One theory is that these outer casings collapsed suddenly, leaving the massive pile of rubble still seen surrounding the central core. From this disaster, the Egyptian architects learned valuable lessons in building techniques. The upper half of the next pyramid was less steep giving it a bent shape, and a subsequent pyramid was built entirely at this shallower angle. So by the time the Giza group was built, the Egyptians had learned from 200 years of experience and human error. Yet, according to von Däniken, there are still some things that require a highly advanced technology. One problem is how the pyramid sides were so accurately aligned to the points of the compass. They deviate only a fraction from the east-west and north-south axes. But you don't need ancient astronauts to explain this accuracy. The fact that stars rise in the east and set in the west was well known to the Egyptian priests. Choosing a bright star, they could have marked its position as it rose, perhaps using an artificial horizon. They would then follow its path across the heavens until it set in the west. This position would also be marked. By bisecting the angle, true north is discovered, and one edge of the pyramid could be set against such a line. Nor is it technically difficult to get a straight edge. A number of men with poles can do it using only line of sight. With men and poles spanning the entire length, the edge of the pyramid could be accurately plotted. The mathematics of the ancient Egyptian surveyors was certainly good enough to measure accurately. But did they have extraterrestrial knowledge? Von Daniken claims the pyramid's height multiplied by a billion gives the distance to the sun. This simply isn't so. The pyramid is 480.93 feet high. Multiply by a billion and you get just over 91 million miles. The sun's average distance is 93 million miles. Not the accuracy you would expect from a space traveling civilization. You say that there is a clear explanation how the Great Pyramid was constructed. And I know this explanation from archaeologists, and I still doubt it. By the way, I have not said in my book that the pyramid was constructed by extraterrestrials. I have speculated that extraterrestrials have left knowledge and tools to our forefathers so that it was easier for them to do it. But we know what sort of tools they used. These simple copper chisels now on display in the Cairo Museum. Hardly the advanced technology of spacemen. Here, too, is the rope that von Daniken says was non-existent. Quantities have been found buried near the pyramid. There are examples of the non-existent wooden mallets and the non-existent rollers. We know what the tools are for and where they were used. These are the ancient stone quarries at Tura, 15 miles across the Nile from the pyramids. They provided many of the blocks for the Great Pyramid of Cheops. Marks of the chisels can still be seen on the rock face. The quarrymen would carve a slot into the face and then split out the blocks from behind. In some places, you can still find uncompleted blocks the size of those at Cheops. 
Despite this, von Däniken still believes that the building of Kiops presented insuperable problems. And that it is time that world governments officially acknowledge Archaeology accepts that the Great Pyramid is constructed of about 2.5 millions of stone blocks. And they say it was constructed within 20 years. If you divide 2.5 millions of stone blocks within 20 years, it would make that every year they had to cut, to polish, to put on place, to transport 120,000 stone blocks. If you take an year with 300 working days, which is a good year because they had some festivities too, and you take a working day of 12 hours, then they had, in fact, to make this whole thing every two minutes, one block. Repeat it today with our technology. How? Yet, even using very simple tools and methods, one or two men can easily break out a stone the size of those used in the pyramids. It takes about 15 minutes. The soft limestone splits easily, and usually along straight lines. The ancient Egyptians would have used wooden wedges, but the principle is the same. In ancient Egypt, ten men could easily have broken out about a dozen such stones in a week, and been able to maneuver them from the quarry without any great difficulty. What was it? With 100,000 men, that would produce 120,000 stones in a season's quarrying, the figure needed to keep the pyramid building on schedule. Speculation is one thing, but facts are another. And in Egypt, von Daniken gets most of his facts wrong. Buried deep in the remote Mexican jungle lie the ruined temples and palaces of a vanished civilization, that of the Maya. Here at Palenque in the 7th century AD, the Indians of the sophisticated Mayan culture built a great ceremonial center. This is the temple of inscriptions. Beneath it lies one of von Daniken's major pieces of evidence. It is a huge sarcophagus lid in an underground burial chamber. Elaborately carved, it depicts what? Von Daniken interprets it in this way. There sits a human being with the upper part of his body bent forward like a racing motorcyclist. Today, any child would identify his vehicle as a rocket. It is pointed at the front, then changes to strangely grooved indentations like inlet ports widens out and terminates at the tail in a darting flame. The crouching being himself is manipulating a number of undefinable controls and has the heel of his left foot on a kind of pedal. His clothing is appropriate. Short trousers with a broad belt, a jacket with a modern Japanese opening at the neck, and closely fitting bands at arms and legs. With our knowledge of similar pictures, we should be surprised if the complicated headgear were missing. And there it is with the usual indentations and tubes and something like antennae on top. Our space traveler, he is clearly depicted as one, is not only bent forward tensely, he is also looking intently at an apparatus hanging in front of his face. Could this startling interpretation that the slab depicts an astronaut be a valid one? Ian Graham of Harvard University is an expert on Mayan symbols. His interpretation of the carving on the slab is quite different from von Däniken's. The sighting of the tomb is unusual. No other Mayan temple has a staircase like this one leading into the heart of the building. It took four years to excavate this stairway. At the bottom, a stone slab concealed the doorway to an impressive tomb. Inside was the Palenque sarcophagus. 
nothing as elaborate as this had ever before been found. The tomb slab was raised. Below it was a sealed coffin. When this was opened, it revealed the skeleton of a man, richly adorned with jade ornaments. Hieroglyphics on the tomb identified him as Pakal, a 7th century ruler. This is his funeral monument. Ian Graham. Well, I certainly don't see any need to regard him as a spaceman. I don't see any oxygen tubes. I see a very characteristically drawn Maya face with the sloping forehead, which is rather common among the Maya, although sometimes it's been exaggerated by deformation during early childhood. And this is crowned by an elaborate hairdo and elements of headdress. Uh, here, an earring suspended from a pierced ear. A nose plug, which has the elements of death because it takes the form of a fleshless bone. Here on his chest, he has a jeweled pectoral ornament suspended by a chain, the end of it, which uh, flares out, or rather a beaded uh, cord. On his wrists, there is a very typical bracelet. Around his waist, a beaded belt with a death's head in front, and a beaded skirt, which is not at all unusual, and anklets, likewise. And the hand on the rocket's controls? As a matter of fact, it's fairly plain that this hand isn't holding on to anything. The Maya like to show hands in rather delicate gestures, many of which may have had meanings which so far escape us. I think this is just a delicate position of the hand. Such gestures are common in Mayan art. There are similar examples on the side of the slab. But what about the rocket flames at the base? These famous flames from the rocket have quite a different explanation. Because we see, for instance, this element down here as consisting of two serpent heads uniting in the bottom. Here's the design. Two serpents joined at the middle, whose beards form Von Daniken's rocket flames. According to Ian Graham, the Maya stylized the serpent from a simple design. Eventually, the serpent's jaw became a rigid shape, with a stylized beard below the lower jaw. The jaw is open. It forms the shape used in the design around the base of the slab, when paired with its mirror image. By removing the elements, the Mayan design on the royal slab becomes clear. There is the Mayan symbol of kingship, a double-headed serpent. Below it lies the dead ruler himself. And finally, the two serpents that form the base. This leaves, on top, a bird symbolizing heaven. A cross-shaped device, the Mayan saber tree supporting heaven. And below, a grotesque earth monster symbol of the underworld. The important point is that these symbols are found in other examples of Mayan art and are common throughout the Maya world. They have been studied for 50 years and they tell a consistent story. I am absolutely familiar myself with the archaeological explanation but I do not agree. I know for sure we have in the case of the Palenque lab a lot of uh, designs, carvings, or what archaeologists call glyphics, which we know from other Maya places. But the question I have is, have they been interpreted from the very beginning correctly? You know, uh, archaeology, in my opinion, is one of the very, very uh, conservative uh, sciences. And I do not doubt, not at all, the integrity or the honesty of any archaeologist. But I ask myself, do they interpret their findings correct? To me, the Palenque stone still today looks like a modern man sitting in some kind of uh, technical uh, apparatus.
we have never found in the whole Maya literature a man sitting in the same position. That's for the first and the only time. So I hope we should wait until we find another guy like this. I see no need at all to invoke any really extreme and extravagant interpretation involving astronauts when the so much simpler and more consistent explanation presents itself of a mere mortuary slab showing the deceased in his passage towards heaven, the Maya heaven. Another startlingly modern interpretation is given to the mysterious lines on the Nazca Desert in Peru. Von Daniken writes, You can make out gigantic lines laid out geometrically, some of which run parallel to each other while others intersect. The archaeologists call them Inca roads, a preposterous idea. Seen from the air, the clear-cut impression they made on me was that of an airfield. In fact, no modern archaeologist claims the lines are roads. The only real road on the desert is the Pan American Highway. And as the lines often run for miles, cross hills, and go over the edges of cliffs, it is a strange pattern for a spaceport. You effortlessly cross hundreds of light years of interstellar space. The space vehicle sets down on the ground. The great bay opens. And out wheel what? B-24 liberators, spitfires. Most remarkable that they need airfields. And that is a kind of temporal chauvinism, which uh, the whole subject uh, is immersed in, unfortunately. I never said that the extraterrestrial needed runways with concrete or something like this. My idea, which I developed in my second book and also in the book In Search of Ancient Gods, the picture book, was that some vehicle was coming down, not an interstellar spaceship, simply a, a, a small vehicle, and landing with an effect maybe even of the air cushion uh, system. So they don't need landing tracks, but simply by the landing itself, some sand and stones are blown away, and you have a simple track on the ground. And after maybe a few hours or a few days, they start again, maybe in another direction, you have a second track, the take-off track. I assume that only later, when the extraterrestrials uh, departed, the natives came to the ground and saw these two lines, landing track and takeoff track, and they would whisper, the fiery gods rode on these lines. And only now they start to protect the lines, to construct the lines, and maybe in the later generations, to make new lines to the east and west and north and south, some direction to stars, because they feel or they saw that the gods have come from the stars. So the interpretation of mine is not lines with concrete, as on a two-day's airfield, but it was a landing, yes. I still should suggest this. But there is another explanation of the lines. It comes from someone who has spent a lifetime studying them. The German scientist Maria Reicha. For over 35 years, working virtually alone and unaided, Maria Reicha has walked almost every foot of the Nazca Desert, measuring and calibrating the shapes in the sand. The Nazca Desert is covered with small rocks that have oxidized to a purplish brown color. The sand underneath is yellow. And it's this contrast in color that was used by the Nazca people a thousand years ago to make the lines. They pushed away the dark stones from the surface to the borders where you can see an accumulation of larger stones and left a surface which in former times was much lighter than now. The wind has carried from the surrounding surface very small dark pebbles over the lines and uh, if we sweep away these dark pebbles, then we restore a line to its original very white light color. Uh, you can see the lines are absolutely straight, and people have wondered very often how the ancient people could do these straight lines without any engineering instrument. 
I had an interesting experience which gave me the clue to this. Uh, I had a uh, helper who had been a furrow tracer, which means a man who prepared... And that it is time that world governments officially acknowledge... ...irrigation and traces absolutely straight, very, very long uh, furrows. This fellow had such good eyesight that he could put a stake at a very, very large distance and uh, scrape along with his foot at an absolutely straight furrow. He could see everything that I saw through the telescope of the theodolite. He could see with the naked eyes. Maria Reicha has shown that many of these long straight lines are connected with the calendar. Some of them, for example, point to the place where the sun sets at the summer or winter solstice, the time when the seasons change. Since the lines were drawn, the Earth's axis has shifted. In this photograph, taken at the winter solstice, the sun has moved from its original position on the horizon. Because of the multitude of lines, the Nazca plane has been interpreted as a gigantic astronomical calendar. One clue comes from the animal figures drawn on the plane. These figures may be connected with the seasons. Many of them, like this giant bird, are also found on the pottery of the Nazca people. There's a huge fish stranded in the desert. A giant spider some 300 feet across. And a monkey, which according to Maria Reicha, is the symbol for the coming of rain. Why this symbol for the coming of rain? The answer is in the stars. In the southern hemisphere, the constellations of Leo, the hunting dogs, and the Big Dipper resemble a monkey with its tail to the left and head to the right. The Nazca people drew this monkey on the ground. The monkey is connected by a thin line to a broad Nazca line that points directly to the rising of the Big Dipper on December 21st, the time when the rains began. The most important problem of the people who live in this region and still now is the arrival of the water uh, in the rivers. They have been dry all through the year and agriculture begins with the arrival of the water. This, uh, they had to prepare their fields for this and had to know when the water was to be expected. To uh, make it bring more water, they would put its image on such a large size on the ground that this divinity could see its own picture from above and uh, would be favorably inclined to send more water. A curious piece of evidence appears in von Daniken's book. A photograph of the Nazca Plain with the legend, this is very reminiscent of the aircraft parking bays on a modern airport. Close up, this area may look like parking bays, but that's not what it is. The photograph is deceptive. The whole area is only some 20 feet across. In fact, it is part of a giant bird, visible only from the air. The parking bays turn out to be part of the left leg of a huge condor. That's absolutely true. You are right here. This photograph, which is in the original version of Chariots of the Gods, is not my photograph. And even the legend, you know, the writing under the photograph was not made by me. It was too late later to correct it. Anyhow, I fully admit that this uh, explanation of being a parking place is simply ridiculous. Ridiculous it may be, but after 10 years and numerous printings, it remains uncorrected in von Daniken's book. Many readers are being misled. So does one accept von Daniken's interpretations? 
or those of someone like Maria Rijka, who has studied the lines for years. Most of the stories of ancient astronauts are associated with remote cultures. Von Daniken has many questions about the statues of Easter Island. Who cut the statues out of the rock? Who carved them? How were they dressed, polished, and erected? How were they moved across country for miles without rollers? And how do they manage it? The implication is that ancient astronauts were involved. In 1955, an expedition led by the Norwegian explorer Tor Heyerdahl landed at Easter Island. Heyerdahl asked the natives how the statues had been erected and published his results in a book, Aku Aku, which came out 10 years before Chariots of the Gods. Are the statues still an unsolved mystery? No, it is not a mystery any longer today. We uh, actually, we know who made them, uh, when they made them, why they made them, how they made them, and even when they stopped uh, making them. Uh, as a matter of fact, they, they were made by the ancestors of the people uh, living on the island today. And uh, through tradition, they remember how their ancestors did it, and uh, they did it in front of our eyes, erected and carved a statue. And it looked like a very slow procedure in the beginning, but they, they poured on water as they worked. And when they first got inside the hard outer shelf of the rock, the work went much quicker. They used no advanced technology, only crude stone picks thousands of which were found in the old quarries. Does this look to you uh, like a very sophisticated uh, tool or the tool from uh, a spacecraft? This is a typical uh, Paleolithic uh, tool, a Stone Age tool. It's not even polished as uh, uh, some of the other tools they use. This is what they used for carving the uh, statues. After only a few days, the outline of a statue had already appeared. We went on only for three days to make an estimate, and it uh, was easy for the archaeologists uh, to figure out that even uh, the largest statues could be completed within a year. Von Daniken claims the island was too barren to provide rope or wood for levers. But Heyerdahl found plenty of evidence for both, and he actually filmed men making rope from the local tough reeds. He also persuaded the islanders to show him how their ancestors had moved the statues. Since we, with less than 200 men, could transport an average statue, even if they didn't concentrate on one statue at a the time, they could easily transport uh, two or three or four statues with a couple of thousand men. The island could with no difficulty whatsoever uh, uh, feed uh, 10,000, 20,000 people. Scientists have been uh, estimating really what the uh, agriculture could feed there and with no problem 20,000 people. The island's forests have been destroyed by fire and agriculture. But at the time the statues were carved, there was plenty of wood for levers. Under the direction of the mayor, the islanders used them to raise a statue as their ancestors had done. They levered up each side and placed rocks underneath. Very soon, the statue rested on a platform of boulders. More rocks were placed underneath to support the statue as the levers gradually inched it upright. It took 12 men, three levers, and 18 days to erect the statue. What was needed was not space technology, but human effort and ingenuity and lots of time. This is a matter of not hundreds of years, but more than a thousand years that these statues were carved. So by carving uh, a few at the time, 
there is no problem at all to explain why uh, close to a thousand statues came about. On Easter Island, as elsewhere, von Daniken underestimates the ability of people who, to his eyes, are primitive and unsophisticated. Well, I think that the people we met there, uh, they proved they were intelligent enough to do it because they did it. And uh, I think it is a pity that we underestimate other people because they don't have uh, the technical standing knowledge we have today. The Easter Island statues were made by men. To invoke the aid of space gods involves deliberately ignoring the evidence. From gold of the gods comes another impressive sounding claim. Von Daniken writes, To me, this is the most incredible, fantastic story of the century. It could easily have come straight from the realm of science fiction if I had not seen and photographed the incredible truth in person. He describes visiting man-made tunnels in Ecuador filled with gold and plastic artifacts from an unknown civilization. He says he visited the caves with explorer Juan Moritz, who had headed an expedition but denies that von Daniken entered the caves or saw such treasures. Did he visit the cave shown in the book? The cave which we see, which we see in here, the photograph in my book, is a place where I have never been. I was not here. I said in uh, the end of this book that this photograph was made by Juan Moritz. And this is a photograph which was made at the expedition of Juan Moritz in 1969. I was never here. I was on a side entrance on a complete different place. But that's not what the book says. Von Daniken clearly describes descending by ropes and switching on his light to visit the underworld of a strange unknown race, illustrated by this very photograph. Did that actually happen? No, that did not happen. But uh, I think when somebody writes books in my style and in my sense who are not scientific books, we call it in Germany Sachbücher. It's a, a kind of popular books, but it's not uh, science fiction, because all the facts do exist, but with other interpretations. Then uh, an author is allowed to use effects. So some little things like this are really not important because they do not touch the facts. They are simply stimulating the reader, and one is allowed to do this. Yet these books are claimed to be factual. So how is the reader to know whether the author is using dramatic effects or whether he is simply telling lies? In Ica, Peru, von Daniken has discovered a museum containing a mysterious collection of engraved stones. The museum is owned by a local surgeon, Dr. Cabrera, who claims his collection is thousands of years old. It contains some very strange things indeed. Engravings on the stones show men gazing through telescopes at the stars, detailed maps of the world, and medical operations. Here, two surgeons bend over a heart transplant patient as they stitch up their incision. This is evidence, says von Daniken, of visits from outer space. While examining the Cabrera stones, von Daniken heard that similar ones were being made by local villagers a few miles away. He went to look. Out in the desert is a small village. There, a local artist called Basilio makes a living out of carving stones for sale to tourists. His stones did indeed resemble those in Dr. Cabrera's museum. Von Daniken inspected them closely. Weren't they, in fact, the same? No, they're not the same. Oh, not at all. I have a lot of photographs here, and naturally I had the stones to compare them. And what Basilo makes is absolutely different. We went to check. Basilio offered to carve a heart transplant. He first drew the design, then began carving the soft rock with a knife. The face appeared within a few minutes. Then the internal organs of the heart transplant patient. Then the organs of the heart transplant patient. 
and the typical cross-hatching found on all the Ica stones. After an hour, the design was finished. To get the antique look, Basilio uses the services of the local donkey. He bakes the stones in donkey dung for an hour. And that it is time that world governments officially acknowledge The final result, a transplant very like those in the museum. Basilio examined von Daniken's book in which the Ica stones appear. Had he carved the stones shown in the photographs? Uh, he says that he has done these stones and uh, it confirms this one with the face of... This stone. Basilio said that these stones shown in von Daniken's book were among the first he made for Dr. Cabrera's museum some ten years ago. Was von Daniken aware that Basilio claimed to have carved these stones? That's what he told me too. He told me he had done all the stones which Cabrera has, all of them. And naturally, I asked Cabrera if this is true, and he said, definitely no, the man is a liar. But Basilio had a local paper with a photograph of Dr. Cabrera's museum. On it was a note thanking Basilio personally for his cooperation in providing stones for the museum. It was signed by Dr. Cabrera. Dr. Cabrera lent us one of the stones he claimed was thousands of years old. We had it examined at the Institute of Geological Sciences in London. They looked first at the shape of the grooves. Under a microscope, the edges of the grooves were distinct and uneroded. Their conclusion? The sharp and relatively clean-cut edges of the grooves are notable, a feature which could not be preserved for long under normal weathering conditions. They then examined the brown layer on top of the stone, where it had oxidized. If the carving were ancient, this oxidation should in time have covered the grooves, but it did not. The Ica stones are modern. Von Daniken has been taken in by Cabrera's story. The evidence presented so forcefully turns out to be worthless. In his books, he presents a challenge to orthodoxy to everything taught in schools and universities. But it is a false challenge. Von Daniken is part of a growing movement of irrationalism that more often than not attacks established knowledge with a great deal of energy, but little solid evidence. He represents a move away from scientific standards. His popular lectures have all the feel of a religious revival meeting. Why does his claim that ancient astronauts have visited Earth have such an impact? Carl Sagan. The idea that we are being visited, or were once visited, by powerful, benign beings who live in the sky is, after all, a religious idea. The terminology is just slightly different. Uh, we don't... Uh, talk about angels, we talk about extraterrestrials, but the emotional significance is identical. So at a time when, for whatever reason, uh, religions have gradually declined in the degree to which uh, the average person believes in them, but the same emotional needs are there, at a time when uh, our society is uh, in occasionally rather dire straits, it would be very nice to believe that there are powerful beings that look after us that are up there in the sky and may uh, dip in and make things right. And, uh, goodness, I would be delighted if that happened. But, uh, you see, it's a dangerous doctrine if it's false. Because it might, uh, for example, lead us to do less than our own best effort to put things right. There is, however, one story of ancient astronauts where it is difficult to provide a rational explanation. So it's a test of how you regard such claims. The 
The story concerns the star Sirius and its small companion star, Sirius B. In 1976, Irving Lindenblad of the Washington Naval Observatory took the first clear photographs of Sirius B, a star totally invisible to the naked eye and discovered only late in the last century. By the 1920s, Sirius B was recognized as a new type of star, a collapsed sun called a white dwarf. It was the first such star ever discovered. In this photo, the bright central star is Sirius, with refraction images on each side. On the bottom right is Sirius B. What is astonishing is that this recently discovered star has apparently been known about for centuries in Africa. For the Dogon tribe in Mali, the invisible Sirius B is the most important star in the heavens. Every 60 years in the Sigui ceremony, they celebrate its existence and its orbit through the heavens. Dogon traditions, which go back for centuries, involve many complex drawings in the sand. And one such drawing is of Sirius and its companion. This is how they depict the main star Sirius. Close to it is the invisible Sirius B. Sirius B, say the Dogon, orbits the main star every 50 years. They draw a second position for B. There is a remarkable resemblance between the Dogon drawing and the real picture of the Sirius system, in which Sirius B does indeed go around Sirius every 50 years. This remarkable accuracy was the starting point for a recent book, The Sirius Mystery. Von Daniken called it a masterpiece. Its author is Robert Temple. American living in England and a member of the Royal Astronomical Society, Temple has for eight years been obsessed with the Dogon's knowledge. He became convinced that this knowledge could have come only from beings from Sirius itself. Why was he so impressed with the Dogon's knowledge of Sirius B? The fact that they know it's there is extraordinary enough, but the fact that they know its exact orbital period is just totally incredible. But it doesn't stop there. They, they seem to realize that the star is super dense, as we know it is, because it's a white dwarf. And super dense matter uh, really only makes sense if you have a theory of nuclear physics. Well, now the Dogon don't have a theory of nuclear physics. So clearly the information came from somewhere um, which was more advanced than their particular culture is technologically. Where did this information come from? How on earth did they get it? It's a mystery. That's why the book is called The Serious Mystery. The logical explanation is that the Dogon's knowledge comes not from ancient astronauts, but from visiting 20th century Westerners who knew about Sirius B. But the Dogon tradition involves not one, but two invisible stars around Sirius. On this mask, the three circles symbolize Sirius and two accompanying stars. In numerous Dogon masks, the head represents Sirius. The horns, two invisible companion stars. These designs date from the 13th or 14th century and are based on a tradition at least 3,000 years old. So the origin of the Dogon's knowledge, if it's being interpreted correctly, is certainly mysterious. But the myths and images of the Dogon Sirius ceremony are subtle and complex. There are problems if you take them too literally. For instance, their drawing of Sirius B's orbit is also described by them as an egg. The stars are inside this orbit, not on it as you'd expect. They place a third star in the middle with a planet. But there are also many other symbols representing mythical beings and general concepts. In Temple's book, these last symbols are omitted, and the diagram turned around so it more closely resembles the true astronomical picture. So only the parts that fit the theory have been selected. One thing the Dogon do tell us is that there is a third star in the Sirius system. No such star has yet been found. If it is, the Dogon will have been proved right.
Dr. Lindenblad has been looking for this star. In the 20s, irregularities in the orbit of Sirius B caused astronomers to think these might indeed be caused by a third star. Now, new measurements have been made. They thought they had found a perturbation uh, that would indicate a third star. Well, we were able to show by our work that that perturbation uh, did not exist and that apparently there is no third star uh, close in, at least, to Sirius B or Sirius A. Since that search, other telescopes have tuned into Sirius. They, too, have found nothing. But Robert Temple is still confident. The fact that a lot of people have been trying for some time now to find such a mundane answer to it, including myself, have not succeeded, indicates that the probabilities get higher and higher that my extraordinary answer, that the Earth may actually have been visited by intelligent extraterrestrials, may really be the true answer. I personally believe that it is the true answer. There is no easy answer. But does lack of rational answers mean that one should claim, as von Daniken does with finality, that space visitors are the explanation? Or is it more accurate to say that in this case we don't yet know? Given the track record of the ancient astronaut theory, which position is more plausible? Von Daniken's thesis rests on inaccuracies on unrelated facts and false similarities. It denies man's ingenuity and abilities, and it uses phony evidence in an attempt to prove its case. Von Daniken's theories may be intriguing, even attractive, but there's not a single solid piece of evidence behind them. The achievements of the past tell us nothing about spacemen but a great deal about the abilities and intelligence of our ancestors. And if we ever are to find other intelligent life among the stars, it'll be because we continue to apply that inventiveness and that questioning spirit which the ancient astronaut theory seeks so strongly to deny.